Oh man, it is so nice to be out climbing. Mount Glenavis today. Just below a hard route that's just been done by Matt Wright quite recently. I'm gonna to try today, hopefully. I've just had quite a big period off for an ankle surgery and I'm still just getting over the lovely novelty of being just outside in the mountains, going climbing. As soon as I put on Instagram that I was having an ankle surgery, loads of you messaged me straight away and said, can you make a video about how you get through surgeries and how you get through major injuries where you have to have a big layoff or much bigger than that, you have the prospect of things not being the same again. And that is the, the situation I have with my ankle. So ever since I've wanted to actually make that video, but I have to admit that it's uh, not a particularly easy video to make. I, I still am in the middle of going through all the mixed feelings that you have when you're coming through a surgery. Where, to be totally honest, you kind of go back and forward from some pretty dark places to feeling really, really good. Well, that's me had my ankle surgery yesterday. I knew that was coming for about a year. That's an old ankle injury from uh, a break that I had 25 years ago. So it's post-traumatic arthritis in the joint, which is not very bad. It's mild arthritis, uh, but I've got a couple of osteophytes, loose bodies at the periphery of the joint that were just bothering me progressively more over the past year starting to limit what I could do, caused me a bit of pain and the limitation of range of movement. So I kind of knew this surgery was coming, so I only had it yesterday and I already feel really good about it. Maybe that's partly drug induced, but <laughs> I do feel better about having had the surgery and I'm just psyched to get on with um, preparing to get back to climbing, hard climbing. So we're on the 13th of June today and uh, we'll see where we're at by October. My goal from between now and then is to work on my strength in my upper body. Yeah, my prime mover's upper body and my fingers. I want to have strong fingers and arms by the time I get to the winter to be ready for the projects I have. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get going with that tomorrow with some gentle fingerboarding and maybe a couple of pull-ups and just go from there progressively more on the board. When you've been waiting a long time for a surgery like this and then you get one, it feels like you've got to the star line and I can actually move forward. Before that, it was just kind of hanging over me. So it's a good feeling. I feel really happy today. You know, the injuries that I've had to my ankles have been a huge part of my life and they, they are every day. I have pain from both my ankles every day and I expect to have that for the rest of my life. So I should warn you right now that this video is not going to be one of these slightly unrealistic videos where someone tells you that, you know, anything is possible and, you know, you can recover 100% from any injury. It's just not like that. There are plenty of injuries where you really can recover. I've had many bad finger injuries, many bad elbow and shoulder injuries. These are ligament and tendon injuries and ligaments and tendons do heal. Tissue always changes over time with battle scars and with age, but functionally you can get back to where you were or better, almost no matter what your level, I would say. But that's ligaments and tendons. Ligaments, tendons and muscles, they, they are plastic tissues. Bone is also a very plastic tissue and it, it recovers very well. So if you have a fracture, you go on a cast, the fracture heals. Generally speaking, obviously there's so many different complex injuries you can have that have slightly different outcomes. But there are also injuries to various different tissues in your body that are not quite straightforward. Things like neurological damage. So if you can avoid a head injury, wear a helmet, don't get head injury. <laughs> I post videos all the time of me soloing in the mountains and and people make comments endlessly, people that don't know anything about climbing, saying, why are you wearing a helmet when you're soloing? Because even a very small rock landing on your head will give you a very serious head injury. And that's definitely something I want to avoid if I can. The other thing is joint injuries. Injuries to joint cartilage, they tend to be more complex, where they leave you with either de degeneration of the joint into osteoarthritis or post-traumatic osteoarthritis, which is what I have in my ankles only mildly, thankfully, for, for in my case. But I know that many of you have had uh, much more serious ankle injuries or to other joints like the knee um, or the shoulder or any of these joints can get the articular surface damaged. And once you damage that articular cartilage, unless you're in your teens and uh, you, know, you can still remodel that, that tissue, once you're age 20 plus, that tissue is damaged and the likelihood is that you may get arthritis in the future. So 25 years ago, I was uh, head pointing at an E8, which would have been my first E8. I just top roped it cleanly, very smoothly, six times. Then I went for the lead, which in this case was actually a solo. 
and I was just standing up through the Crocs move thinking I'm going to do this, I feel really solid and the, the Crocs pebble that I was pushing down on snapped off and decked out, broke my ankle quite badly and had an osteochondral fracture where a portion of the articular cartilage surface of my talus and my ankle uh, broke off on the actual talar dome with a chunk of bone underneath and that had to heal, it never healed perfectly. That insult to the joint is a kind of lasting damage and I remember the surgeon at the time saying to me you may have osteoarthritis in 10 years. Well it's 25 years later and I've done very well but I do have a little bit of mild arthritis in that joint now. So the periphery of the joint has a little bit of degeneration of the cartilage um, and it's had some bone spurs growing around the edge and that's why I've had all these surgeries to to try and correct as much as you can correct them. You can chop off the bone spurs, you can trim away the damaged cartilage but you can't replace it with new cartilage and new cartilage won't grow. So hopefully <laughs> I have enough cartilage left in both my ankles for them to continue uh, to allow me to do climbing and mountaineering. I think they will. Good stuff, well that's my top rope up so I'm going to wait till the sun goes off the route and then I'll get on it and try the moves. Really I want this video to be more general about the psychology of dealing with major injuries, you know, injuries that really give you a challenge that make you think, can I actually recover from this? Can I get back to where I was? Can I come out and enjoy climbing in the way I did before? I think it's fair to say that as climbers go, I'm as keen as any climber and I always have been since I started about 30 years ago. Um, you know, I've made climbing the kind of centre of my life and all, all of the other activities I do in my life are all kind of arranged so that I can spend a lot of time climbing and, and especially hard climbing. And, you know, in a 30 year career of climbing, I've had plenty of opportunity to learn to deal with um, both having layoffs of climbing and also dealing with just being injured, not being on top form. And, you know, over my 30s and into my 40s, I've had fewer and fewer of those injuries. And I think, um, although obviously I'm getting older, um, at the same time, you know, you're also learning more about physiology. You're also learning to have more discipline, more resilience, more knowledge to make good decisions. So I do actually feel healthier than I did when I was 25. And that's just about uh, practicalities. And so when I get like golfer's elbow or tennis elbow, which I actually have had small flare ups of those in the past couple of years, um, I kind of, I'm not nearly as worried about them because I know that that's, that recovery from them is just down to good decision making and uh, the discipline of carrying out the rehab and I will get there. I guess if I was to condense what I wanted to say in this video down to one sort of simple statement is that, you know, I have felt very dark <laughs> in the sort of worst periods of um, realising that I'm going to need a surgery, realising that it's going to be uncertain and I'm going to have this worry, am I going to be able to recover? The only thing that's closest to a shortcut to get through them is to press on with the rehab and try to make my whole body as healthy as possible. Okay, the sun is just about to disappear behind the hills, so I think I'm going to get on this route now and try some moves. God! Wet feet, wet hands. Not ideal. Too wet. Shite. Well, that was a link. <laughs> but I mean, several of the, both the holds and the footholds were wet. The water is actually flowing out of the break at the bottom. It needs a long dry spell to actually do this. Cool, there we go. Finished in the light as well. Well, start of October. If we get two dry weeks in October, maybe. But uh, that's kind of unlikely, so. Probably in the spring, come back in April, or if we get a really dry frosty period in the winter when the seeps are actually frozen, maybe. On that, I didn't think about my ankle for the whole time I was on that. So although right now I know that I couldn't just run up all the memoirs there <laughs> and just do a big mountain day, at least I know I can go to a crag and climb and have a period where I don't feel pain and I don't think about my ankle. That's a, that's a really good result. I dare say at some point 
in the next 10 years, 20 years, who knows. I will start to feel that ankle again more and um, it may start to deteriorate further. But I kind of take some comfort in that um, I do like all types of climbing. And so if I could just do uh, cragging like this, then I would be fine. I mean, already, like, even just jumping off my board, I don't really jump off my board anymore, and I, I can't really climb in commercial bouldering walls. I mean, I can, but I can't jump off the top of them, like, one, you know, again and again. It just isn't going to work. Anyway, it's getting dark now, so I'm going to head back home, and tomorrow I'll get on my board, and while I'm doing that, I'll talk about some people who really inspired me to find a way through injury problems. In your own time, If you wouldn't mind. So back in the board today, and I'll be doing just another bouldering session. While I'm going through this bouldering session, I'll talk to you a bit more about the specifics, like the kind of day-to-day -day of how I actually got through the surgery I've just had. I think the main psychological technique I use is extremely simple. It's just reminding myself that everyone at some point is going to go through this kind of thing, some really difficult injury, some difficult challenge that's going to mean they're going to have to take a break from their climbing. Right, I'm going to get warmed up. So one of the things that I did that was quite important was just to get out climbing um, and enjoy the mountains as much as I could before I actually went in for my surgery. A much more important thing that I did though was to narrow my goals a little bit. I did start to not really think about long-term trips or ideas or climbing goals and narrow it much more down to just actually what I was doing that day uh, and where I would climb in the next week. Learning to think like that does just prepare you for the actual post-surgery process where really that's all you can control is how you feel today and you don't really know when you're going to be able to be capable of other things a bit further into the future. Another really important thing was to actually just prepare the environment that I was going to actually do the rehab in. So I'm, I'm obviously so lucky that I have this brilliant climbing wall to train in. And you know, anyone who has a home training setup, it's a great thing to have, a pivotal thing to have, not just when you're training in health, if you like, and you're training for your goals, but also in times like this where you're recovering from a surgery. Because a big part of going for a surgery is, well, are you going to go to the climbing wall, your local climbing centre and train? Probably not. You might, it might be a bit of a, a bittersweet experience for you to actually do that. You know, to go and be with the people who you normally climb with, you normally train with. And it might just remind you of all the things that you can't do. I mean, that might not be a problem. It, it could work either way. It depends on your psychology, really. You know, if you go to your local climbing wall, on your own crutches or something like that and just do what climbing you can. You know, if that feels good, if that feels rewarding, then fine, keep doing it. But for some of you, I would imagine that it might feel frustrating. <laughs> so that's me now, four months, I think, out from my surgery. And one of the big things that I'm going through and actually might always go through is that I can't really fall off, off my board. Or I can, but not habitually. So some of the climbs in here, like the one I was just trying there, um, the last move, if it's got a hard last move, it's a big jump and it's a bit wild. I just have to leave it. Um, again, that's where having the flexibility of your own training setup really comes into its own because you can adapt the training according to your limitations at the time. So it's really not a bother for me to set a bunch of boulder problems that are just close to the ground. In fact, I'll show you a little um, workaround I got when I was only just started on my rock shoes and I couldn't even I couldn't even land hard from like normal height. So I just had this setup where I could fall onto my ass on the stacked mats. <laughs> Something as simple as that allowed me to boulder really hard at a stage in my recovery when I otherwise wouldn't have. But I hope it doesn't come across like it was easy for me because it wasn't. You know, I, I had many nights in those first weeks and even now where I would lie awake and worry, <laughs> worry that it wouldn't work out. But rather like negative thoughts of, of any kind, you can't necessarily stop them from happening. 
and you might not even, that might not even be all that desirable because they tend to be the thing that makes you keep adjusting your decisions and your, your plan in order to get the best outcome. So the, the worry does serve a positive function in a way. So rather than feel like I needed to try and crush those thoughts and, or stop them or feel, feel guilty or awkward for having them, I just kind of try to roll with them instead and accept that they're going to come. I'm going to be concerned and worried that the process wouldn't work out because it's very important to me. <laughs> so the sort of, I feel like there's no way around that. Now, obviously that is a lot easier said than done, but what else are you going to do? I think the biggest mental thing is the fear of loss, the fear that you're not going to get back what you had before. And I just think if your physical form and your climbing ability and your sort of physical prowess is worth having, it's actually because you could lose it, it's because you had to work hard to get it. That is the, that's where its value lies. Having a, a rehab process, all it does is put you back in the process and make you work for it again. And it's the working for it that gave you the enjoyment in the first place. And so working for it a second time or a third time, or in my case, I'm four surgeries in, um, and I've had to just go back to square one and do those rehabs over and over and over again. And yes, you go through the loss, but then you go through the gain again. <laughs> I actually think that regaining fitness and regaining physical form can actually be more fun and more rewarding than it was in the first place when you were doing it when you were a teenager and it was sort of easier in a way because you only need to look at a climbing wall to get stronger. <laughs> and then I suppose the second psychological tactic I use is to just realise and understand that there is only one way out of the situation you're in, which is training. Consistent training over time. <laughs> And if you think about it in those terms, it kind of simplifies everything. You know, you can worry and you can feel down and you can go through tough periods. But ultimately, what you've got to do always remains the same. It's always going to be rehab work and training. And that's what's going to get you to the other side and nothing else. So that always brings me back out of thinking of the future, the fear of what I might lose in the future if the rehab, the rehab and the recovery doesn't go all that well. And it brings me back to thinking about what do I have to do right now? What's the next stage? Can I do any more training today? Or can I do some more resting and recovering? Can I go and eat a good meal that's going to nourish my body? Can I sleep and rest and recover? Can I spend time with my family and give myself mentally a break from the stress and then come back tomorrow and apply a little bit more pressure to keep the progress going? Speaking of family, I do think that a big vulnerability for a lot of athletes is that their sport is the only thing in their life. I think it's fine and I think it's good for your sport, um, something like climbing, to be a big part of your identity. Uh, that's a brilliant thing and it definitely is a big part of my identity. But it's not everything. People who have good friends, especially a family and especially children, they're at a real advantage here because there's nothing quite like your your child kind of smiling at you and having a kind of lighthearted joke with you, even when you feel really, really bad to lift your spirits it actually makes me a little bit emotional thinking about it. You know, friends or family just transport you out of your little bubble of worry and take you to a different place. And that just allows you to sort of suspend the time until you worry about it again, until you do the next training session and then that's what's going to get you a little bit further. Another thing that's going to allow you to get you through the time period, that you, the big chunk of time that it's going to take you to heal from a major injury is getting other shit done in your life. You know, there will be a time in the future when you want to focus your time on your climbing or whatever your sport is. When you've got your layoff, you know, that's, that is a real opportunity to tackle those things. Almost everyone has big projects that they can get their teeth into. In my case, I finished writing a book that I was writing. So I feel like although I, I don't have much to be proud of in my sort of climbing achievements, you know, I haven't climbed any E10s for the last four months, but I have done something that is sort of just as good in a way. I think the journey that people go through to recover from major injuries can be kind of lonely at times because you are excluded from the normal group of people that you climb with and you maybe don't connect or have a reason to connect with uh, other people who are going through the same thing at the same time. That's also why I'm making this video. So one of the consequences I think of that relative isolation is that you can be taken down this path mentally, if you like, of, of thinking in a certain way about the process that you're going through um, and, and becoming kind of negative about it. As with normal training where you learn a lot from a coach, I think it's also really good to, to find mentorship or help to get you through 
the re recovery process because it's just the same as, as it's a form of training if you like you're having to try and adapt Ad adaptation is the, the key word of this video really and one of the mentors that i learned from at a distance i think most of my climbing mentors were sort of at a distance was uh, andy nisbet and when i started climbing andy was one of the best winter climbers in scotland and in the world and he'd done countless new routes but what i didn't know was that he'd had many injuries and when i first met him and saw him out in the hill i later made a film about him he looked kind of broken he always looked like it he obviously had major musculoskeletal problems, you know, he'd, he'd built up many battle scars over the years. And I recall going to a talk by some climbing partners of his who went on a, a expedition with him in, in the Himalayas, I think in the 1980s. And they were saying that um, even in like the mid 1980s, like they were sort of observing him getting out of the tent in the morning and thinking that he looked really kind of broken and he'd had all these injuries and he was really struggling. And I thought, wow, you know, obviously that's a long time ago now. And he, he still looks the same, but he still just does the same. When I was filming him in 2014, I was watching how he was moving on the, the mixed ground. And you can, you just sort of get this sort of telltale signals of the way someone moves that they've, they have had quite major injuries in the past. But he just made it work. He just made it work by adapting and, and working within the slightly narrowed confines of what his body would allow him to do. And I remember thinking, Wow, that's that's what I want to do. And I think, you know, motivation to recover from significant injuries is very similar to the motivation required to do hard climbing in the first place. You have to have a, a, a drivenness, like a sheer need to do the climb, which overtakes everything else. And also to force your way through the setbacks that you have when you're recovering from an injury. So in a sense, if it feels painful to be missing climbing, that's a good thing, that, that, that is the motivation, that pain of not being able to do the thing is literally the motivation to do the work and to uh, endure the process that you, you have to go through, both in terms of physical and mental pain and discomfort. Many people who've recovered from really bad injuries, and some people who replied to the post I made on my Instagram asking for what things you'd like me to talk about in this video, said that, the times after they had their very worst injuries were always the times when they climbed their hardest and often stepped up a level in their climbing to new heights of performance. And that's been the case for me several times. <laughs> I can't believe it. I've been waiting for this route to dry out for like six weeks, coming and trying it, going up and working in the glen so that I can see if the seeps are drying out and I thought today I might finally dry out with the wind that we've had recently and there's just a couple of trees that have come down a bit further along the glen and they've shut the road and they're saying on this sign that they're going to shut it for nearly a, or actually more than a week. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Never, not to worry. I went home and got my bike so I've got my bike and I'm going to cycle not on the road and uh, I can go up myself, but it means I can't lead it. I would have led it tonight. Hard enough getting stuff dry in Scotland to do. Never mind the road being shut. Didn't see that coming. <sighs> well, made it to the crag. It's just getting dark and it's, um, it's raining a bit. And it's very cold. Um, maybe two hours ago it would have been fine to lead. I'm not too sure. Oh, it's going to be one of those nights where it's like, make yourself climb. It's forecast to rain every day for the next week. <laughs> it's only light rain. So I'm still clinging on to some hope that the bog that's feeding the seeps at the top of this crag uh, up there, is still going to be slowly drying out. And um, at some point in the next four or five days, uh, there might be a, a, a decent day that I can get on the lead on this thing. What was that feeling where you're like, one half of your brain says, this is desperate, it's ridiculous. And the other half of your brain says, no, you can make this happen. <laughs> Which one will win? One way to find out. I just heard that the road's back open in Glenevis 
and I've just had a message from Cubby, I've just been talking to him about getting on this route, he was maybe going to take some pictures of me on it, but he's offered to actually hold my ropes today, so I'm just packing all my rack again and getting back up the glen. Oh man, I do not want to waste this chance. You can never know if you're definitely going to do a route, but I am ready to lead the route if the conditions are right. So, as long as the rain stays off, I am not going to waste this opportunity and I'm going to really go for it. I really want to get this done. If I do fail on it today, it certainly won't be for a lack of trying. It won't be for a lack of going for it. But basically, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Uh, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just behind a little loose flake. Okay. The next one's good though. Okay. That's a good one. Nice one, Dave. Excellent. You made that look like a DA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really good conditions. Like amazing. It's just perfect, wasn't it? Excellent. Well done. Whew.